Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Files. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, where we talk bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day, and today, I'm coming live from my den here in the heart of the northwest of England. I'm uh, completely surrounded by my stuff. The den is in complete disarray following Grogmeat, the annual meetup we have in November in the great city of Manchester. It's a one-day event that takes place over three days, and this time it seemed like the best ever. The games masters and players chimed together perfectly, and we took over the city with our blend of rolling dice and hardcore socialising. On Sunday morning, Mike Mason, the guest of honour, joined us in Fanboy 3 for an interview. He's a returning guest to the Grog Pod, Previously, he's faced the Games Master screen to talk about his personal history with Call of Cthulhu. He's the creative director of the game for Chaosium, so this time we rolled back the years and looked at the artefacts from the history of Call of Cthulhu. It includes the Cthulhu campaign starring Cthulhu, Shadows of Yog sothoth which we talk about but forget to name. We kept pointing at it instead. So bear that in mind. We go back to the game's origins and along the way we discover the secret life of the cults of Cthulhu. Last time we studied the cults of Glorantha, so this time we're looking at the great elder god himself. Blythe, our resident rules lawyer, joins me in the great library of RPGs to look at the Cults of Cthulhu book from 2021, written by Chris Lackey and Mike Mason, and we look at a couple of articles from Different Worlds, issue 45. Later, we have some closing time chat about our plans for next year and a recent substack that I've posted. I realise that we're covering old ground by returning to Call of Cthulhu and testing the patience of those who are eager for us to cover other vintage greats such as Flashing Blades, Lords of Creation and many others. We'll get to them eventually. The GrogPod content reflects what we're playing has certainly been a back-to-basics for us. Back-to-basic role-playing, BRP, RuneQuest, Call of Cthulhu, Ringworld and lots and lots and lots of Stormbringer. I hope you'll forgive our indulgence. I'll be back at the end with some notices and virtual gifts for new patrons. But for now, ramblers, let's get rambling. Hello, my name is Dirt the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, where we talk bobbins about tabletop RPGs from back in the day and today. I'm coming live from Grogmeat. Yay! Here in Manchester, Fanboy 3, and on my right, I've got Mike Mason. Hello there, Mike. Hello there, Dirt. And on my left, I have the ridiculous (laughs) homemade shrine... To the actor, Caroline. Would you like to give it a tap? Oh, I would, please. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a special way to tap it? No, you tap it how you like. <laughs> Let's have a look. Here we go. Oh, it's Carla from the Captain Kronos. <laughs> Vampire Hunter. There we go. Because we're going to go back in time. Like Kronos. We're going to move through time, roll back the years. <laughs> Mike, are you up for this? Well, sir, I, I certainly am. Yeah, good, good. You've been on the road quite a bit this year, though, haven't you? you well, well I have. Well, in the latter half of the year, yes. 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 I've been to America. Yeah. Went to Game Old Con about a month ago. And then I've been come to Manchester. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a lot of travelling. And you've been up to Edinburgh as a... And, and I was in Edinburgh at the beginning of the week for a, for 24 hours, yeah, doing yeah. a talk. Yeah. And that's your, your first step into academia, is it? Or? Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, I, 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 I did a, uh, I did a talk at, um, Edge Hill University in Liverpool a couple of years back. Yeah. And then I've done some online projects with universities. There's a, uh, one in America I've done a couple of projects with in terms of a group of students who are putting together a, a role playing supplement. 
acting as a semi-class mentor kind of thing, that kind of stuff. So I've done a little yeah. bit here and there, that kind of thing. And I did a, uh, a, a day of working with postgraduate creative writers at Derby University back in the summer where we talked about game design in terms of fiction writing. Right, okay. And then I ran them a game. Oh, fantastic. And they all died. <laughs> In that's, character, the in character. that's the spirit. That's the spirit. It does seem to be that there's quite a few universities now that have got departments that are looking at games, which seems mainly uh, computer gaming, or is that a misconception? Yeah, it's a misconception. I mean, I had exactly that conversation in Edinburgh with the, uh, the Edinburgh, Edinburgh University, and that, that the, the, the bit of the university I was um, kind of working with was the history and games lab. Right. And their particular take is history. They're the history teachers, right. or lecturers. And so they're coming at role playing from an historical perspective in terms of using history as a context within role playing games. Obviously, Call of Duty fits up pretty well because, you know, you're playing in the 20s or Regency England or Weimar Berlin. And so there's, it's a very easy kind of connection that you can kind of see. But, uh, but equally, you know, Derby, I was working with the creative writing students, nothing to do with history just coming up with cool ideas and turning them into fiction or, or, or kind of uh, game design. Um, and it tends to fall both ways. And then you've got computer games in the middle. Right. You know, um, somebody like Pender Tomlinson, who's uh, a lecturer in computer design, while these students are there to design computer games, he gets them designing board games and he gets them running role-playing games. Yeah. Because it's, a, as he sees, a, a foundational to understanding how games work. Yes. And, and, uh, and the kind of rules of particularly in the role-playing game, the rules of how a scenario progresses yeah. and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, it covers a lot of kind of bases, really, really. Well, yeah. you know, as, as we know with gaming. Yeah, i have not considered that before. So in Call of Cthulhu, it's history as a setting, isn't it? So uh, it's how you engage with uh, history. So how much of your time is spent uh, looking at historical documents? Or, uh, you know, what, where, where's your go-to places when you're working on supplements it, it comes down to what it is you're looking for i mean often the majority if you kind of add up all the time of research it's looking at old maps or trying to find an old map yeah and often it's actually you try and find street maps so for instance the example i would give is in the in the new masks of Nalathotep. there's a whole segment that was missing from the original where you've got this uh, workshop in derby in derbyshire um that's mentioned in the book in the original but isn't actually described. And clearly, most adventurers, when they get here about oh, the workshop in Derby that's building a spaceship, <laughs> oh, let's ignore that. No, they, they'll go there. So I yeah. felt we had to kind of map it out. So I was trying to find 1926 street plans of Derby to just work out where a workshop might be. You know, you know I could make it up. And then yeah. somebody who lives in Derby is running and going, why did they put it there? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you try, yeah, because everything else in the book is fairly historically accurate. You kind of don't want to let the side down. So spend a lot of time trying to find that. And they're not easy to find, you know, yeah. those, those kind of deep, that kind of level of detail. I've, I'm getting flashbacks now to UK Games Expo last year on the KLCM stand where you sold me a copy of Mastanay Athleta. Indeed. Because you said it covers pear soap. Is that? I, I said it's got the mention of pear soap. A bit of pear it. soap, yeah. and that was the that sealed the deal for some. But it, it, and it, it was more than just a bar of soap. There was the uh, it was a London exhibition where they had pear soap sponsored this big exhibit of right. um, you, we might call it soap around the ages, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> and, and uh, there was a little bay. It was like a big circular thing, and you went around it, and in each kind of bay there was a kind of a glass. And behind the glass was a lady from history, so like Anne Boleyn with her soap. Oh, and then there was, yeah. you know, Queen Anne or whoever it is, you know, all these different characters. And you go around, they're all actresses, kind of like... With soap. With soap. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's the kind of level of high detail we go for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. And the, the theme of this is rolling back the years and looking back at Call of Cthulhu through your experience and uh, how it came about. And uh, I've got a few artefacts. Some of them you'll have to imagine. <laughs> Theatre of the mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to start with this, uh, mine. Oh. This is a Call of Cthulhu actual book and H.P. Lovecraft. I suppose my question is, why is the game so successful based on these books? Because... You know, at the time, KSM was bringing out Stormbringer, Elfquest, which you could play a lot of in his convention. <laughs> um, so why, why is it that Call of Cthulhu was the one that 
took hold and uh, what is it to do with the source material that has made it such a phenomena? I think it's two things. One is it was the first horror role playing game. Right. Um, there hadn't been any, there hadn't been any horror role playing before then, as far as mm-hmm. I was concerned. In terms of D and D, there was Ravenloft had not yet happened, uh, and so forth. So there was nothing really, you know, in terms of published kind of mainstream role playing stuff. You know, Traveller, RuneQuest, D and D, and then some others. But Call of Cthulhu was the first one. So often the first to market is the one that kind of cements itself in the in the, in the in kind of the imagination of what it is about a uh, horror game. Um, but I think that's not enough on itself to kind of maintain its position. So I think it's the, it is the, the bit that comes out of Lovecraft, which is the core, which is the idea of cosmic horror. Yeah. Because, um, it could have very easily been a game on ha- hammer horror. Yes. It could have been any other kind of type of horror, but all of those are fairly limiting. Yeah. That, um, they don't go so far. And also they become commonplace because, uh, like Hammer Horror, there's only so many gothic castles with Dracula going in before, before, I mean, it's too going to turn into a comedy anyway in a role playing game. Yeah. There isn't much horror to actually find. And when you do, that's going to get used up really quickly because there's only so many of the same story you can keep playing. Cosmic Horror, because it's a wider concept allows for much more freedom and kind of latitude in terms of the things you can explore. It also chimes much more deeply or resonantly with a modern audience, with a, with a 20th century, 21st century audience who, um, who actually the horror of vampires and, and werewolves and that is meaningless. We're not scared of these things. They're not, right, yeah. we're not, we're not isolated villagers living in the Middle Ages who don't know any better. And, and every, everyone who's a stranger is a potential evil or wrong person or is a werewolf or whatever. Yeah. We don't live in that world anymore. We live in a very connected world where that, those aren't fears. Mm-hmm. We do have fears of the unknown, which is obviously at the root of the cosmic horror. Um, and we have fears of, you know, isolation and our, our place, not only in the world, but our place in the universe and being insignificant and all the rest of it. And that chimes with the modern kind of um, consciousness in that way. So I think you add all that together, that makes it much more kind of powerful uh, mix for a, for something you can kind of enjoy. And like I always say, horror is not for everyone, just like airfix models aren't for everyone. Yeah, yeah. But if it is, then that's a horror you can actually attach to because you can understand it. Yeah. I can't understand being afraid of a werewolf. Mm. I can't genuinely understand it. So it's a bloke who turns into a wolf. I've yeah. never seen one. They don't exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But aliens might. Aliens might come down and just drop some sort of, you know, biological warfare on us, like as in a drop of something, and we're all dead. Yeah. I mean, that's that is feasible. Aliens might already be here. Well, I didn't want to didn't want to worry people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it's as it's oranges or the origins in that. Uh, concept though doesn't it that wasn't it sandy original pitch was like a uh like a, an american gothic horror type yeah. thing yeah they, they, the original kind of pitch was a, a kind of as you say american gothic a kind of modern day um just again pulling together kind of various horror strands but kind of based in that kind of using lovecraft's kind of more of more of his kind of stories that were like the you know the terrible old man or um i'm trying to think of another one now like it, like it's really shorter form stories which are more like you know like a um like a episode of night gallery or whatever it might be and uh but he wanted to have the monster I mean, sandy loves monsters and and that was really his big draw with the mythos you know it's got big monsters that yeah. are cool and they're not werewolves because they're something different and u- unusual um and so that was that was a take and um uh, but it was greg i think particularly who said no we want to we want to set it in history want they want to set it in the 1920s where it's kind of got that kind of it's got a certain charm about it mm. and there's and there's also a there's a distance to it as well yeah um and I think that was a good choice because I don't, I don't know whether, because we've seen, well, we've seen factually Call of Cthulhu scenarios released in, you know, from the 1980s through the, uh, you know, through the early 2000s that were set in the modern day quickly become yesterday, yes. really quickly. Yeah. And in fact, the majority of stuff in those books is, is written about the technology of the day and it's completely useless now because it's like how, you know, the original Cthulhu Now book had like at least 
two pages on how a modem works. Yes. Yeah. I mean, no, but somebody, the editor should have said, it doesn't matter how mate. all you've got to do is make the roll, mate. Does, it make, does it work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to understand how it works. And more often than not, it didn't work. It yeah. didn't work. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. It's like, we don't, there's no, there's no, there's no uh, detailed schematic to an internal custom, combustion <laughs> engine for a car, for drive autos. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so it's, but because it was new, and writers love writing about that new thing, a lot of these modern books are filled up with that kind of guffin uh, that, uh, that is meaningless, actually, in the game. There's not bad gameplay. I think it's a um, testament to the gamer brain to codify Lovecraft's world, though, isn't it? Sure. Because that's what the rules do, isn't it? I mean, there's no sense that there is uh, any logic or any uh, mythos around it, really. It's it's just, it, it's not a structured thing, is it? In, uh, no, there's, there's no, there's no canon. There. Lovecraft had no canon. Yeah. And anyone who's tried to impose a canon ultimately fails because, because there is none. Um, and, and again, that means the world of the game has remained very open source in a sense, in terms of you, you can do anything you like. So if you're in your game, if Cthulhu in your game is, is a, a, a an ant-like creature, five centimeters big, there's no one to argue that it couldn't be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There is no canon. So it allows a lot of creativity and freedom to kind of mess things around. And then, which you see in a fiction. I mean, that's the other kind of feedback loop is obviously it's not just Lovecraft. The game is inspired by it. The game is actually more inspired by August de Leth. Right. You know, it's far more, you know, if you read August de Leth's kind of pastiches of Lovecraft, um, it's far more what the game is about. It's far more like investigators kind of running around and battling things. Um, and the game is far, you know, if the game owes a debt to any author, really it's August the left, to be right. frank. Right. But equally, you know, there's many authors at the time and subsequently that, that have, you know, inspired the game. You know, Ramsey Campbell still writing, Brian Lumley, uh, Robert Block, et cetera, et cetera. And to, you know, even, you know, really contemporary writers. So if you want to, because there's no, I'm sorry, there's no rules, there's no canon. If you want to take your deep ones down the road of Ruth Anna Emerus and being, you know, this kind of much more kind of downtrodden, seen as a, seen as a, um, protagonist rather than an antagonist, you can if that's the kind of style of game you want to do. No one's, no, the fun police aren't coming around, are they? So, yeah. um, you can do it. And that's the beauty of the game and why it works in so many different permutations because your flavor of Call of Cthulhu might be very different to mine, mm-hmm. but it's just as valid. And you can go and enjoy your high pulp version of Cthulhu while I play some grim and dirty, historically accurate version. Yeah. They're both the same game, yeah. but it can do both things. And that's why I think it's, it, it continues to be very successful in that way because it, it brings a lot to the table and allows you to bring a lot to it. It's not, it doesn't tell you what you can't do. It's always, well, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. yeah. And it also, I think it shows that around that time in the uh, 70s, um, certain authors would be go-to for the games, wouldn't it? So uh, a lot of uh, gaming emerged from science fiction conventions. So you get Moorcock uh, yeah. rubbing shoulders with uh, these guys at that time. And I think Lovecraft was in the ether at that time, wasn't it? Because it was predated, wasn't it, by the Lovecraft variant, which was a Tunnels and Trolls uh, version of... Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, that's, that was instrumental because... Um, that, I can't remember where it was. So it was uh, like Sorcerer's, 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 Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, and the, the Raman brothers, wasn't it? Who yeah. Put the article together. Um, and it, I mean, it, you, it, the DNA is, is evident in it. It's got emotional stability. If you encounter a scene where emotional stability would be questioned, you make a saving throw versus emotional uh, stability. And there's a whole series of effects that run from, I'm not quite sure how you play this, but there's one that the early ones are like your your character is aghast, which I yeah. quite that's my favourite. I'm aghast. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how I role play that, but okay. <laughs> and then to the end one, it is your character dies of fright. You know? Yeah, and, yeah. And so it's got a sanity system in there, and Sandy was hadn't designed a sanity system at that point, and and saw that and went, oh, that's pretty good. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll try that, and and clearly, uh, you know. Uh, and he did, you know, he, uh, he had to his, to his credit, he has always credited, he, yeah. you know, he didn't say, oh, oh, I came up with all myself. No, he did, he always said that he saw that article and it, it kind of inspired him. Um, so it's, you know, it's, you know, it feeds back into itself that way. Yeah. Call of Cthulhu came out in 1981 and a couple of years ago you did a Kickstarter for the 40th anniversary. Yeah. Um, so he, that's the thing with uh, KSM, he's got quite a lot of heritage uh, products, hasn't it? So... I, how, how do you plan these things uh, to come out? I've got mine here. And like all 
Kickstarters, it hasn't been opened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to open it now. Okay. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's the value decrease as I do it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so how, how does a project like that uh, start? And, uh, who, who, well, who, basically, who, um, no, it's normally Rick, right, who is so. the keeper of old things. <laughs> um, we'll go, uh, you know, we could do a... Um, we could do a, a, a reprint of that old uh, starter set or uh, old box set. And, and mainly the reason being is because you just think it'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then we go into a kind of an, uh, a debate about one, you know, whoever the line, it could be, it could be Stormbring, it could be RuneQuest, Jason, yeah. or, call it because it's me. And we have a debate about, is that a good idea? So, cause, you know, there was, there was talk a few years back about bringing, uh, the, the, you know, doing it a few years ago. And I said, I'm, I'm not sure it's a good time because we've only just put out a new edition of Call of Cthulhu. And now you're putting out the second edition. It's kind of a bit of a negative message to say, oh, here's a new one, but here's the second edition. We know you want that one really. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and it, and it didn't feel right timing wise. It didn't feel that there'd been enough time to kind of, you know, for people to kind of decide whether they like seventh edition, let alone carry on playing it. Yeah. And so, um, I kind of kicked, put that, <laughs> put that <laughs> on that one. Um, but then, you know, it's like, like 10 years since it came out. Mm. Um, so eight years ago, Rick sort of said, Oh, you know, do you think it's a good time now? And I said, yeah, it's 40th anniversary. That yeah. makes to me a really good valid reason because we can look forward as we look back as well. Um, and so, um, that you know that was what happened and it was part of the the kind of celebration for the 40th uh birthday of the game and it was also there's a kind of a another layer to it because there's a lot of old material old scenarios and that some people have kind of hammered on my door saying oh when are you going to update for yeah. that when are you can you update that that you know shadows of yogg and all the rest of it and the answer is well one day we will get to it but we've got I've got, got a load of thoughts. <laughs> do you really want Call of Duty to just be greatest hits? Because we yeah. could stop. Yeah. We could just stop and never print anything new because it's a 40-year-old game and we could just repeat 40 years from day one. Well, just, you know. Just think of all the opportunities to stick a, some pair of soap in. Ex exactly. <laughs> Did you did you have the box set back in there? What was your? What I had, your first my, the first box set I had was the GW um, uh, hardback local. No, 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 no the, the box the, set. The box set. The box set, but it was the English. Oh yeah, reprint yeah. kind That's of the, the Games Workshop reprint one, so the green, do, green box kind of thing. Do you want to open mine now? I, I think you should. I'll hold it. You, 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 right. you, you do the special bit. Oh, there. oh. <laughs> oh I've no nails. <laughs> I haven't got any nails. I've got. No, you need a you need a special Massive. game opener box. Yeah, we're not doing. Can we give feedback? Hey, I've got I've got I've got a hole. I've got, yeah. I've got a hey, hole. Got to go, go in. You get your finger in. Yeah. <laughs> Stop making your own jokes up. Right, here we go. Yeah, with this oh, unboxing. This is the way forward. It, it might catch on. What's in this What's box? In, in I'll, I'll 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 hold it. Right, here we go. Uh, so this was always the most exciting page, wasn't it? Yes. What's in this box? <laughs> Because what's the first thing you're looking for when you buy your first role-playing game? You want to know what's in it. No, you want to see where the board is. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> there's, no board, board. there's no board listed. <laughs> okay. Oh, some character sheets. And this is the original rule book. I'm going to skip over that because I want to look at this. The source oak for the twins. That, that was my favourite bit. Was it? Yeah. Well, why, why was it your favourite bit? What was it in there that you liked? Well, I think... It's this bit here, on cultists, <laughs> yeah. Because I find I find creating adventures it would be difficult with the monsters because they just seem so tough. But yeah. The idea that they'd be cultists, yeah. Uh, it only took us forty years to write a book on cultists. I know, yeah. <laughs> and I, I wanted to mention that because that's been my favourite book of recent years. So we've had cults of Garantha last time, yeah. And cults of Cthulhu. Cults so of Cthulhu. Tell us about that project. Well, I mean, it was again. Coming up for 40th anniversary, and it's kind of like, well, the one thing we've never done, apart from that, that's the only book that Cthulhu actually appears in, technically. Right. And and it was getting on for 40 years. It's kind of like, could we have another one, maybe? Yeah. And and so um, I kind of came with the idea, let's do a Cults of Cthulhu where it's just Cthulhu. We could have done Cults of the Mythos, we could talk about all the other gods. I thought, it's not that. No, let's just do Cthulhu. The game, his name's on the box. 
let's he can at least have one book. Yeah. <laughs> and so um and but the idea from the word go was although there's some monsters in it and and and, and all that kind of stuff, it's about the human monsters because they actually yeah. are the they are the the antagonists in in scenarios you know ninety percent of the time, and we don't really ever get into their motivations or how you can use them as a keeper, how you can kind of create them to kind of design your own kind of scenarios and campaigns and so the whole point was to kind of do that, but through the idea of the the Cthulhu cult in a sense because you know if you read the original kind of call of Cthulhu story, the idea of the Cthulhu cult is it's it's it's, it's, it's expansive massive worldwide conspiracy that never appears in this book about cthulhu by the way um and um how do you how do you make that how do you make a world-spanning conspiracy work in a game and so the idea being you know you you, it is world-spanning but it's actually like every other cult in the in the real world they're all against one another all got my 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 interpretation is better than your interpretation you've got it wrong i'm the one who's right i'm the one who's going to get through his blessing even though we're on the same side and we'll work together a bit at the end of the day i will stab you in the back because i'm going to be the one and that's you know that's the nature of cults and that kind of thing in in the game anyway yeah no it's a beautifully written uh book and uh as you said there is uh some tips and techniques on creating your own cults aren't they yeah so there's a um chris lackey did a lot of work on um defining uh the kind of questions you need to kind of think about um, when you are kind of designing, you know, your big bad, your big bad cult that's going to be your kind of antagonist in, in a, in a, in a, maybe a long, a longer running kind of campaign type setup. Um, and it's, but it's in it, but it's what's great about it is actually the down to, down to earth day to day stuff. Cause actually that's what makes it work. Yeah. Where do they get the money from? Yeah. What, you know, do they have a front? How do they recruit people? What do they tell people to recruit them? Yeah. What do the actual cultists believe? Yeah. And, and there's so many different permutations of that. You know, are, are they after power? Are they after wealth? Are they, you know, whatever, you know, and, and, and understanding that actually what the inner circle believes and says to the, the initiates or the, the lay members could be completely lost. Yes. Yeah. They just want, they're, they're just a workforce, aren't they? Yeah. To, to you. So it's kind of understanding where that all fits together. And, and the book kind of, kind of makes go through like a workbook kind of almost, uh, uh, to kind of workshop this through. And you can design a pretty, pretty solid cult really pretty quickly. And there's a load of examples obviously in the book to kind of, if you can't be bothered, you can just take one of these and change the name. Yeah. But, um, but the idea is to kind of really give you a lot of strong foundation. So you can feel confident that you know what, you know, in any situation, you know what the cult's going to do or what that member or that, what that particular level of person in the cult, what their likely reaction is, which is kind of when you're running a game, what you want to know, you want to know what your NPCs are up to, what your monsters are up to without having to work it out at the gaming table. You can just, because you've already yeah. done it. You've done all, the, done all your prep work beforehand. Yeah. Also in this uh, box, I know this is uh, something close to your heart, isn't it? Oh, it's it's silent. Silent. yeah. So like the first Cthulhu book I ever saw. The first one? Yeah. So it's... Uh, it was the cover that... The cover, for some reason, rem- immediately reminded me of Marillion 12 inches. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I like those, although I must like this. So yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, also in it, the Cthulhu Companion. And I love the uh, cover on this one, uh, the trailer to Thogwood. So the fact that these have appeared in here, does this mean that they're unlikely to get a, a 70 No, that, I mean, the, there's a, there's, the beauty of it is, is that we can cherry pick because they're, they exist out there. You don't, yeah. There's no one like, oh, I need to get this and they can't get it. We can cherry pick bits of them. We might not do the, we may never do fragments of the entire book revamped, but we might say we like the Valley of the Four Winds scenario and that would fit really well in this other book we're doing. We might put that in and do an update on it. And, yeah. And so it gives a bit of freedom to do that. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, things like Shadows of Yogg's Resolve one day will get revised, but the trouble is when I say revised, completely rewritten is yeah. what I actually mean. Yeah. Because how can you have a Cthulhu campaign where Cthulhu rises and never mention the Cthulhu cult? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that doesn't compute to me. And, it, and it's not the fault of the campaign because the campaign wasn't designed to be a campaign. I know. It's a bunch of scenarios that was thrown together at the last minute to make a campaign. And that's why, you know, when we look back and go, the first, you know, the campaign that set the mold for Call of Cthulhu is Masks and Lathotep, which wasn't the first campaign that came out. That was the first campaign that came out. Yeah. But that didn't set the mold. No. 
And there's also a, a size comparison chart. Look at that. <laughs> to see the Cthulhu uh, beasts. Now, I think I mentioned this when you were last on. Uh, you <laughs> complained to Dagon that in the, in the Games Workshop version yeah. that the monsters were rubbish. I did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the drawings of the monsters. I didn't like the monsters. And you still feel like that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen, uh, you know, I think it's really hard because you can't draw monsters, can you? You can't draw eldritch horrors. You can't draw them because it will never convey the horror. So you have to just accept that this is a version. This is a, a, a an artist interpretation, you know, and some of them are better than others, obviously. Yeah. And in uh, 1983, Grenadier produced... Uh, miniatures, didn't they, of the monsters, like Shoggoths and so Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have any of them? I had a load of them. Did you? I had, some of them were painted. Yeah. <laughs> some of them never got painted. Um, but yeah, no, I, I loved it. And then GW brought out a load of, um, when they when they started doing their third edition Call of Cthulhu, they had a whole range of gothic monsters, or I can't remember what they were called, but they, you know, they had went from the full range of vampires to mummies to kind of various investigators kind of types and stuff like that. So I had a load of those. But my main memory of miniatures, other than working for GW, which is a whole different story, but um, is uh, when we started doing the uh, the uh, Chaosium kind of um, Cthulhu Masters tournament in the UK, and I said, well, what, what do we give the winner? Because I hadn't thought of that. Uh, <laughs> And they all looked at me, well, what do we get the winner? Well, what I used to do was get one of those big Cthulhu models and spray it gold and put it on the stand like a trophy. Oh, that'll do. Yeah. So hence why on my shelf for the COVID years are a bunch of Cthulhu trophies that I made in terms of like big Cthulhu painted gold on trophies with winner, you know, winner Cthulhu Masters 2021, 22 or whatever. Whatever the years COVID happened, that's <laughs> it's just, I don't know if they're ever going to move. I mean, yeah. you know, unclaimed, yeah. unclaimed. Yeah. So, did you did you play with their miniatures then? Uh, Not very often. I mean, it's one of them things in your head. You know, I, I mean, I like miniatures. What that's one of the key reasons why I got into role playing to start with. Yeah, I, I love miniatures. Um, and so, we, you know, you, 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 you're playing Call of Cthulhu, you, you like the game, they bring out miniatures, Grenadier have got miniatures out, oh, I'm going to buy them, because they're Cthulhu miniatures, and they look great, and, and, they, and you get them in, and it doesn't occur to you whether you're going to use them in the game, because they're just, they're just cool miniatures, yeah? And then when you start playing the game, and you realise, I don't need these miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> it all fit in the mind. The, the only time I actually really have sense of, you know, seriously use miniatures is, is during Master and Athotep, and one scene only. Yeah. Where, um, the, the game session that we were about to play was when they, they, they were, they'd gone below the pyramid and are about to kind of enter the big, the big cult compound, the big ritual that's happening under the pyramids. So I spent half an afternoon getting every miniature I own out on a table and recreating the scene in on the table oh, and covering it with a big blanket, kind of very carefully, not to knock them all over. So when the players came in, I could go, Here's your characters and they're, they're at this little doorway here and you yeah. go through and then reveal and like, and literally it's like this, just kept going this massive chamber just yeah. because I knew it would be like a good effect. And they go, oh, that big, all of them. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's the only time I've really used them in game, to be honest. And that, that's why it's looking like this, uh, size comparison thing is to give you an idea of the scale of yeah. it. Cause that is sometimes a challenge with, uh, Cthulhu, isn't it? To, uh, put the scale in. We mentioned Dagon. And uh, I've got a copy of Dagon here, if people are not familiar with it. Is that number four? In no, number seven, number this seven. one. Yeah. I never had that one. You know. I, don't know. I had no, number I mean, one. <laughs> I had number one, and then I think it was like issue eight or nine is the first one I actually started getting subscribed and Yeah. Subscribing. So how, how important do you think uh, the fandom and fan activity around the role-playing game has kind of encouraged it? Because when we talk about... Other KSE products like Glorantha, they, they really kept it, kept it going. How important do you think it is to, uh, Cthulhu? Oh, really vital. Yeah. Um, I, and I think again, you know, like with Glorantha, that kept the game alive when the game was dead. And although Call of Cthulhu has never been dead, it has gone through very fallow periods. Yeah. Um, or periods where their KSE was, um, struggling financially to kind of get anything out and maybe they were they were getting stuff out but it was like maybe one or two books a year if you're lucky uh and so there wasn't a lot to fill in that gap 
And so that's when fans like Dagon and then Unspeakable Oath and then I did The Whisperer um, helped to kind of fill a bit of a gap for a while. Um, and certainly it kept, you know, when, when I was getting Dagon, although it wasn't like in a truly fallow period of um, Call of Cthulhu, what, what it did do is show an inspiration that actually you can write stuff, you can share stuff, you can, mm-hmm. this isn't just for Americans to write. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was something that, you know, anyone could do. And uh, so it was kind of a little bit like punky thoughts in, you know, we're over a, do over a phone box and make a record kind of yeah. thing. It, it was kind of like, you know, anyone could actually do this. It isn't just the reserve of people you'll never meet. Um, and so, it, it, you know, like the reason for many people who get into role playing games it is a, it is an inspiration to creativity, whether it's the creativity in the game that you play, the creation of props, the handouts, the artwork, making a podcast, whatever it may be. There's a lot of people get inspired to do something. So it isn't, it's, it, it, and that's why it's a very different form of pastime to reading or watching TV, which can inspire creativity in some people, but not generally. Um, role playing does yeah. inspire that. And uh, so the whisperer. How long was uh, that running for? Just talk. I did five issues, one a year for about. I think it was over five or six years, kind of in, in total. Um, and, and and the only reason I did that is because Dagon was no longer out. Unspeakable, unspeakable oath had died, and again wasn't out. And there was no, as we would now call it, community happening stuff for the game. And it was like, I was just waiting for someone to do something because uh, I enjoyed reading them and, yeah. you know, and nobody did anything. And so he got to that point where I was just like, well, if no one's going to do it, I'll, I'll do it then. I'll do it then. Yeah. But I, it wasn't like, oh, now's my chance. It was like, oh, I wish somebody else was doing this. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and, um, and that's what kind of to just kind of fill a gap really. Cause I could, I always felt it was really important to have the official side of the game and the unofficial community side of the game. I yeah. felt that that worked really well. Yeah, you know, because the unofficial community side could have a moan and tell you what you know, tell you tell you it was wrong, or give you a give you a house rule fix, or hey, have you thought about doing this this way? Um, that got you kind of thinking a bit more widely. You know, you weren't just waiting on the next release. You had something. To, you had something to read in between the releases, basically. Yeah, and uh, do you still have the archive of that? I mean, it, I've what, got. I've got when it was on. I mean, I, I, it was made on computer, but it, this is computer back in floppy disks. Yeah, so. Um, I, I, there, I, somewhere in my house, there might be a, a floppy disk with all five issues on it, but I can't find it. Right. So all I've got is literally oh, one, lost cop- gold. Lost one gold. copy of hard copy of each of the issues. Right. I've got one copy. Each. So when people go, Oh, if you sell any issue, look, issue ones, you can sell me. Oh, no, I haven't. Yeah. And then I get the question, Well, when are you going to put them on to drive through? Yeah. Well, I, I can't because I don't own the copyright on most of the stuff in them because. Right. It's a fanzine and there are, you know, there, there are named people like Adam Crossingham, who's, you know, uh, 60 Stone Press these days and, uh, uh, and a bunch of other kind of, you know, authors that, you know, are authors and written stuff that I'm pretty sure they would, you know, they don't want me putting their stuff out for free. Yeah. You know? So, uh, I can't, I can't, and, you know, and it's a lot of work to go and hunt a lot of these people down now. Yeah. Some of them I know, but some of them I've disappeared yeah. into the other. So it's what makes it special, though, I guess, isn't it? Because it's locked in time. It's locked in time. And was that concurrent um, with the Cult of Keepers that you were doing that? It was sort of, I, yeah, it must be. I think I started it before the Cult, but it kind of about halfway through. Oh, no, 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 no. I'll tell you a lie. No, I started the Cult before, just before. And then this, because my initial, my brilliant idea originally was, oh, I'll start this, you know, bunch of scenario writers who run commit, and now I'll have these scenarios, and then I'll have a fanzine that, they, that we can print them all in. That never happened. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the idea, that that never happened. So, yeah, they were kind of in parallel, more or less, more or less. Yeah. But, uh, the, the, the fanzine was happening, but, but it was a separate thing, kind of, during the, during the Cult of Keepers. Yeah. And you showed me, um, you, you used a score sheet, didn't you? Cause we had a bit of a competitive game on Friday night, a tournament game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems very subjective. You talk about the fun police. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> making judgment on other people's role. Well, I agree. How, I agree. how did that work? It, it was more a reaction against the RPGA who were very kind of, um, formulaic in terms of like, did the, uh, did they um, kill this monster tick? Did they 
get this amount of XP tick. And it was very kind of like stuff you would do in a game in, in a sense, but it didn't really allow for any role playing. Yes. And so we were much more kind of like, did they, did the character, did the player get into the spirit of the game? Did the character, did they, did they, um, were they have fun playing the character? Did, did they, yeah. did they put the character on? Did they contribute to solving the plot? Did, it, those kind of questions that weren't kind of, there were more, you know, there were less kind of, um, hard numbers than just a feeling. And, um, but what we tried to do, we tried to go do peer review. And we would say to people playing in the tournament, because we'd have at least normally four different scenarios being run by at least four to six different keepers on the, at the same convention. And we'd say that anyone can play in the games, but if you want to be considered for the tournament, you've got to play in at least two of the games. Right. Okay. So that would mean we'd have two different keepers come in talking about the same person potentially. And, and often they would differ. Oh. And then we'd have a comp, then we'd get everyone else in. And then we'd get like, well, you played with them last year. What were they like in your game then? And there'd be like a short list. And we'd have a discussion, go, well, I think, you know, everyone's sort of saying that that person really contributed to the game consistently this year and last year and all the rest of it that we'll give them the prize. I mean, it was never like a big deal. They got like yeah. a biscuit tin, didn't they? And you're continuing to create. So outside of your, uh, activity with uh, Call of Cthulhu. You've got a new project, writing fiction. Do you want to tell us about that and how that works? Well, it's a little eldritch, but yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so me and Paul Fricker, um, neither of us got time or really the inclination at the moment to sort of sit down and write novels and do that kind of thing. But we have got a bit of time to kind of just write a little bit of fiction. So, so, so Paul kind of suggested it to kind of say, why don't we just write some micro fiction? And I was... I'd already been writing a little bit. Paul had already been writing a little bit. And it was really just a kind of diversion, kind of using a slightly different part of the brain um, to just, you know, to do something other than RPG editing and writing. And so that kind of came together in, in this kind of the idea of the uh, Mason and Fricker's Eldritch Stories podcast. Uh, and where we would just, you know, we'd write micro fiction. We'd each write a weirdy horror story. Uh, we'd, we'd, we'd read each other's out. And put them out as a short podcast. And that was, and that was the idea. And then Paul then made it more complicated by saying, well, we'll do that every other week. And then, and I thought, that's great. So we can, I can write, you know, 10 stories, you know, over the next few months. Then I ain't got to do anything for a year because all of them, I can go to Paul's, read his stories, day doing that. I got, you know, that's my work done. Then he suggests, well, no, every other week we're going to do it. We're going to do a podcast where we're chatting. Oh, that's more work now. So, but yeah, okay. So, so we, so we'd end up into that format where, uh, in a month you get every other week, you get a, a piece of fiction from Paul or, or me read by the other. Uh, and then in the in between weeks, we do a kind of like 45 minute talk, uh, chat about whatever is on our minds. It's, it's literally kind of, you know, films, TV, role playing games. What's, what's wrong in the world? What's yeah. great about Arnish, Arnish Schwarzenegger or whatever it is, whatever's yeah. on our mind, what we watched last night on TV. And we'll have a chat about that and, um, and put it out. And so, yeah, so people can find that at eldritchstories.com and you can find it on the, the usual podcast feeds and even YouTube, which I was yeah. amazed by. And I believe that you've recorded one in the last ago. Well, we, in fact, last night we were, I think, inspired by another podcast that apparently that <laughs> we'd heard that they, they'd recorded there and it was somewhat hollowed ground for podcasting. And um, <laughs> and we took the opportunity to uh, to do a, a quick live uh, live recording of in the last yeah. in manchester at grog meet 20, you know, 2023 my rules lawyer is preparing a cease and desist <laughs> <laughs> it was all paul's idea wasn't me <laughs> i recommend people uh to tune into that because the uh the stories are short aren't they it's, it's five five to ten, ten minutes, minutes at yeah. most yeah yeah and uh the good little uh tells of the unexpected type things aren't they yeah. or as i used to call it and not, I don't mean this about our stories, but I used to call it tales of the blatantly obvious. <laughs> yeah. uh, but our stories, hopefully, are, you know, some of them are obvious, but yeah, yeah. But no, it's, yeah, it is exactly that kind of format. Just uh, a little bit of weirdness for your morning, afternoon, or whatever it is when you, whenever you listen. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for being our special guest at Grogmy. Before you finish, yeah. I've got a surprise. Ooh. I've, I've, I've got you a present. Ooh. <laughs> Now, don't get 
bit too excited. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> I bought you. I bought you some match. It's nearly Christmas. Oh. <laughs> nearly Christmas. Thank you. Um, and I was thinking, what, what can I take to... And I, I thought, well, he's like, he's like the RPG matchmaker, isn't he? Yeah. Bring, brings us all together. Oh. Oh. Thank so you very you. much, mate. I just get the dust off it. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah, that's great, that. Thank you very much. I will put it with my shrine. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, please uh, give Mike a hand in the usual way. Thank you very much. Use. Welcome to the Zoom of Role Playing Rambling. I'm joined by Resident Rules Lawyer Blythe. Hello, Blythe. Hello, Dirk. Um, it's uh, been uh, difficult to get together, hasn't it, this time between Christmas markets and Sophie Alex Baxter getting between us. <laughs> it's, you know, it's prevents us doing it. But we're, we're in the great library of RPGs, and with library use, we like to pluck from the shelves something of interest. And this time, we're looking at the recently published Cults of Cthulhu. And we've got, from the archive, Chaos Seems House Magazine, Different Worlds, number 45, which was published in March and April 1987. I've got a prefab sprout game for you, though, before we start. Before we start, okay. You're trying to sc- get, score a point after last time, after your defeat last time. Well, it feels like I have to up my game a bit because you did the first one last time and it was a bit better than the ones I do. So I feel like now I'm compelled to to try and improve yeah. it. Up your game. I think you have to. Bit of sport in it. I think the Glorampan Colts did, did do me a bit of a favour, to be honest, because it was very easy to come up with some nonsense. Well, let's see how I do then, because I've got some fictional cults. The cults from fiction as they appear. You know, we're having some fun with cults now. Obviously, yep. cults can be fun, but they can also be traumatic and terrible. So we're concentrating on the fictional cults here. So fictional, not not real cults. No. Yeah. So okay. So what I've got is I've got uh, four of them. One of them. They're all made up. There's one that I've made up. Mm. Yeah, you standard format. Yeah. Okay, so the first one. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go on. The, the Cause. The Cause. The cause. Yeah. They, were, they were an Irish pop band in the 90s, weren't they? <laughs> real. That's real. <laughs> <laughs> it's cult with a charismatic leader who aims to separate humans from their animal instincts Using a series of questions known as processing. So, how does that sound? Separate them from their animal instinct. Yes. A series of questions known as processing. The cause. The cause. That's the first one. Okay. Okay. Got a note of that one? Yeah, I made a note of that. Diligently getting that down. Next one is the thuggy. The thuggy. And the thuggy thuggy worship Carly, the goddess of war and destruction. Yeah, and they decorate their deity with dismembered body parts. And here's a trigger warning: they use children as slave labour. The oh, thuggy. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I won't. I won't pass comment until you've given me them all. Okay, that's uh, that's probably very wise. Very wise. Okay. The third one, the Tempestas, and uh, these have got connections to a Southern Death Cult formed. In the early 80s, and they're known for the female members recruiting other members by offering protection. Tempestas, Southern Death Cult. Yeah, a Southern, Southern Death Cult. Southern? Yeah, Southern. Southern, southern Death. What, like Cockneys? What, I'm, uh, I, if I, if I offered Southern any more, if I offered any more advice, it might reveal. Without, would never give you too much away. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking like, they're, they're like a cult. They're all eating, you know, pie and mash and jelly deals. Jelly yeah. deals. <laughs> it's okay. all like the cast of EastEnders. There we go. <laughs> Next one: the Nuke <laughs> Cult. The Nuke Cult. Nuke Cult. Okay. Yeah. So these are a group of people. Uh, stand for the designer drug Nuke. Uh, they operate out of Detroit, 
and they enhance the proliferation of the drug by terrorist acts against pharma companies and rehabilitation clinics. Okay, yeah. so those are your those are your four. Right. Well, I, I think the thuggy cult is is a, a genuine one. I mean, they're not none of them are genuine, are they? No, no, they're all fictional. You're fictional, aren't they? Well, which they're not fictional, but one's fictional from your head, whereas yes, the others are exactly. fictional from other people's heads. That's that's right. Okay. Well, yeah. I think the thuggy cult is definitely an authentic fictional cult because I think that's Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom. Well uh, done. Well done. You spotted that, it. Though. Can't yeah, that. yeah. That, that one's I've, kind of easy. The rest of them, I'm, I'm a bit. It's a, it, of course, Indiana Jones in Temple doing family favorite, along with mm. dismembered body parts and the use of children as slave labor. You know, yeah. they know to please the crowd. Freeze the children at the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, fair. Well, so you've eliminated Sorry, that. Well there, done. If you've, not, if you've not seen it. Now the others, uh, yeah. Did, and, and again, I'm going to make, I'm going to fool myself here, a bit like you did last time. I'm going to start saying that I think I've heard of this, but it could be just imagined. You could have just presented it in a convincing fashion. And I think the nuke cult, that, that rings a vague bell somewhere. Nuke being a kind of, uh, a drug that somewhere in my head, I can't, I can't, but that, that seems like something I've encountered before in a film or story and, I think that's a, an authentic made up one. So Yeah, well done, well done. That's a good spot. That is from Robocop. Robocop that's two it, they that's appear. It, that's it, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that leaves right. Tempestors and the cars. Southern, Southern Death Cult. I'm gonna say the one <laughs> I just can't imagine why you would say Southern why you would say Southern Death Cult. If, if you know someone else has made that up, why would you think? I'm going to say the one that you made up is the cars. I'm going the to cars. say you made the cars up. No, the cars uh, is The Master 2012 Paul Thomas Anderson film with Philip Seymour Hoffman as the charismatic leader. Oh, yeah. Very good film, the, the that actually. Highly the recommend one. it. Back to the yeah. one you made up. Yeah, the cult, the drummer from the cult is called John Tempesta, and the band were originally the Death Cult, a band down south. And there's a clue here, there's a clue. Known for female members recruiting other members by offering protection. Oh, she sells sanctuary. She sells sanctuary. Oh, you smart ass. There you go. (laughs) You got me back for last time. Well, yeah, I have. I have. Yes. It's a southern death cult. It just it made me think. You take it too seriously, this. Oh, you take a great delight in it. I, I wanted to talk about cults because, uh, as I would mentioned in the interview with uh, Mike Mason, when I saw the source book of the 1920s, the mention of cults kind of brought Call of Cthulhu alive to me because it all seemed very esoteric and bleak until I thought... Oh well, human beings can be horrible in this. Yeah, well, yeah, that's and and I suppose that's a it's a big part of Call of Cthulhu, isn't it? Cults and the humans, humans as a kind of intermediaries between normal humans and normal world and the world of these strange creatures and gods and what have you. That's the key part of it, aren't they? Really? Yeah, and I, I made an admission on Twitter or X. Or whatever yeah. it's called whatever this week. It's, whatever it's called. Oh, it's funny with X, isn't it? That on the news, they talk about X and always say formally Twitter. Will they ever yeah. stop saying formally Twitter? You might as well call it Elon, if you're listening. You might as well just go back to calling it Twitter because everyone still calls it Twitter. They, they don't call it X. They call it X, formerly known as Twitter. So on X, formerly known as Twitter, I said that <laughs> I've not read a lot of H.P. Lovecraft the primary text and as a student mm. of literature, I I disgust myself because I rely entirely on secondary text, but primarily the game has taught me a lot about yeah. Call of Cthulhu and the, the Cthulhu uh, mythos and listening to podcasts about it. And as I read Shadow of Innsmouth, really for the first time, is that the same with you? I think you, you're the same, aren't you? I'm you're, the not... same uh, as a student of literature as yourself, that I think the reason I've not read any is because I'm a student of literature. You know? <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> I've read, I've read, 
few. The one I remember is Call of Cthulhu. I've read the Call of Cthulhu story, and it was okay. Like you, I think it's strange with Call of Cthulhu, the game, isn't it? Because there's a massive, I think there's a massive gulf between the original source material and what Call of Cthulhu has become. I mean, when you read, and admittedly, I've not read, I've not read all of it, or all his work, so I, I'm, I'm coming at it from a very narrow perspective, admittedly. But when I read Call of Cthulhu, it seemed, it seemed to be a huge gulf between what's in that story and what's in the game. You know, the game has evolved into something much bigger than his writing, I think. Yeah. And like you, I've, I've got all my understanding of Cthulhu from the game, really, not yeah. from the writing. And, and, I don't, I don't, and I don't think without, without Call of Cthulhu, the game, I would never have read H.P. Lovecraft. I don't think I would ever have read it. I only read yeah. Call of Cthulhu out of, of interest of, well, go on, I'll, I'll read one of the stories and see what they're like, you know, because I'm playing the game. I might as well see what the stories are like. Yeah. I, I think it was difficult to get hold of the books when we were uh, getting into the game. They weren't readily available. I think they were and gradually reprinted in those strange Grafton copies with the weird covers. Reading Shadow Over Innsmouth now, I got a kind of newfound respect for Lovecraft's writing. I think out of his short stories, it's probably one that's one of his best. And there were things about it that I quite admire. I quite like the layers of narration in it and how there's like a, a distance between it so that it, Never came quite clear whether this were what level was it an unreliable account of uh, what was happening. Um, mm. So I did, I did, uh, I, I did enjoy that, and I've been enjoying the good friends of Jackson Elias who've done a, a deep dive into it. But I think looking at this cults book, Cults of Cthulhu, I think it's really helpful for me because it actually looks at some of that source text and. Mm regurgitates it, brings it back, reframes it as gaming stuff, isn't it? And that that is that's really powerful, I think. I, I agree. I, I really like it. And I would say I would go as far as to say that if someone had bought seventh edition Cthulhu and all they had was the rules and they said what what should I buy next? I would say buy Cults of Cthulhu. Because yeah. I think it, it does a really good job of Framing what the game, or what a key, not not entirely what the game is about, because as we said before, the great thing about Call of Cthulhu is you can bend it and twist it into anything you want, really, to to a greater or lesser extent. But I think what it does, it reminds you of the kind of roots of the game, the core of the game, by these cults and explain, and also goes a goes a good distance in explaining where these cults come from and how they operate. Because one of our standing jokes when we played Cthulhu back in the day, and even even until re- recently, was always, what are these people doing? What are these people doing yeah. with a big tentacle monster? What are you playing at? What's, what's the advantage? But, of course, the book goes into the fact that not everyone in the cult will really be aware of what they're doing. And that yeah. kind of thing. But it's it's great because it, it it gives you, doesn't it, four, four or five cults in there and then it gives you some tables to create your own but it but it does talk about the structure where they get the money from and all those kind of things that are very very interesting and a great and kind of generate ideas for scenarios as well so it's yeah, not fine. just sim, it's not as simple as evil cult trying to destroy the world go and stop them there's, there's more to it you know because they're an organization and within an organization there are rivalries and all sorts of things like that going on yeah i was i was the, the thing thing that got me straight away and uh, reading it at the beginning was this idea that it reminded me the core principle of call of cthulhu is this idea that there is the call of cthulhu and that there is this great extraterrestrial entity under the sea which is dreaming or sending signals out into the cosmos and some humans are receiving them and interpreting them, mm. and it has a strange effect on them. Yeah, and there was some a bit of a eureka moment because with all the supplements and everything you've read, you thought, of course, that's <laughs> that, that that's yeah. what it's all about, isn't it? That, that is what yeah. the game's about. It's called it's called Call of Cthulhu, and yeah, 
is strangely ignored the call of Cthulhu. Yeah. <laughs> it needs someone to point out to idiots like us. <laughs> that's what the game's really about. All right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's that's true, isn't it? Yeah. It, it, in the book, it talks about the idols, doesn't it? People who found the idols that kind of transmit thoughts to them and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It does. That's why I, I suppose that's that's kind of what I mean about it. It gets back to like first principles, doesn't it? And it's quite refreshing to read it and think, oh yeah, this this is what this game is about. It's yeah. Kind of a back back to basics treatment of it. But that's not not in a bad way, in a in a in a good way, you know, in terms of just re- refreshing your brain a bit, thinking, oh, right, yeah, yeah, that's what that's what the game's about. We've done this. We've done the. We're having this discussion as like a companion to what we were discussing last time around Glorantha, mm. so another chaos creation. But that's a secondary world, isn't it? So that's a world that has been developed from scratch, and Call of Cthulhu is a primary world it's about our world and again it's been distorted by uh, these influences I, I was when i was reading this i was struck by the idea that actually that that issue of you know that we were talking about last time of breaking the world by not having an awareness mm. of the canon or having sufficient knowledge of the law which kind of we talked about last time, didn't we? We 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 yeah. we glanced that. It's never an issue, is it? And it's because it goes out of its way. This book to say a lot of this is a mystery, and that we don't yeah. understand it. Yeah, yeah. It gives you it gives you kind of spaces for, for kind of well not space, but it gives you kind of elbow room to maneuver and and do your own thing because. There are blank spaces in it and bits people don't know about. And that's, that's integral to Call of Cthulhu, isn't it? And because it's an integral part of it, that's what makes it easy to come up with ideas and not worry about, like, say, breaking the rules or going against the mythos or anything like that. Because again, when you read some of the mythos, it, it's contradictory anyway, isn't it? I mean, when you read yeah. those, those monster supplements, the, the, what's the monster, the monstrous, whatever they did and the, the one about the uh, gods and everything. When you read them, it is it is a kind of, and this this sounds I don't mean it the way it sounds. It's, it's kind of a hodgepodge of different deities and different creatures all doing their own weird thing. And whilst there is a kind of backstory, there is like a history and a mythos, but it doesn't. Like you say, there's grey areas and blurred edges to it, so that you can do your own thing. Really, I think yeah. that's the that's the key to it. It's not, and it's not trying to pin pin it down whereas the thing with Galanthra I suppose is it's there's a definitive quality to it isn't there Which well I think is, is it because be is it because is it because it's a secondary world that we would need it explained to us in a bit mm. more detail so there's like a thirst for more knowledge so we talked last time that too is contradictory isn't it it's got contradictory myths but yeah. for some reason you feel the desire to track them and yeah. understand how they contradict. Whereas in Cthulhu, you're less concerned about that because, you know, I think it uses the phrase in this, doesn't it? don't sweat the big stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, just concentrate on how it's affecting the people that you're interacting with. You don't have to worry about the machinations of the great entities that is happening. Yeah. You just need to concern yourself with what's happening in that moment. Mm. What's happening in the weird building down the road, kind of thing. Yeah. Don't worry about that. The other bit, the, the opening section actually tracks, doesn't it? And I think some of this is part of the fiction and probably part of the published material where it does a timeline to show cults have manifested right from the, you know, 2000 BC to the present day and all the points in between and is, is any one of those descriptions. So if you take the Yonkers revival in 1892, you could just read that section and it has inspiration, doesn't it? It has things that you think, ah, oh, right. Okay. So this is a, this is a seed of an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, d- definitely. And it's full of those kind of ideas as well. I mean, the, the, the cults as well have their own scenario hooks and things like that that you can kind of jump on and come up with ideas from, yeah. 
But yeah, the timeline is is quite good. It's good fun, isn't it? The well to hell, 1485, yeah. Things like that. Yeah, plenty of, plenty of ideas, but like you say, they're not ideas that feel sort of restrictive in any way. And there's five write-ups of cults. Mm. And talking of Shadow of Smith, there's a, a 1920s editor, Esoteric Order of Dagon in there for good measure for that Innsmouth look. And I like this one, The Church of Perfect Science, a modern one. Yeah, the modern one's quite, quite good, isn't it? It's quite, quite funny as well because it, it, it may has parallels. Not, it may or may this. not be based on, on real weird religions that certain yeah. Hollywood stars involved <laughs> in. <laughs> a particularly litigious uh, cult. Yeah. Yes. That will just pass yeah. over and just we'll, make that we'll reference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And as you say, there is quite an extensive bit of creating your own Cthulhu yeah. cult. Understand this is this is the real meat of it, isn't it? I think this bit, if you read this bit, this is the bit that really generates the ideas for you to Yeah. Uh, develop further because there's a few tables in there that you can roll against to understand the goals and yeah. what the structure is and start to populate it and what that might look like and as soon as you start rolling on those tables you start generating ideas don't you of how this how this might uh, fit in yeah well it reminded me a bit of the there's a supplement for tales from the loop the column and it's the chapter called the mystery machine where you roll to create a mystery you roll on tables to create a mystery and it always surprises me that you can sit there and roll something up and suddenly think oh yeah that connects with that and it, it'll just fire your imagination and this is a similar kind of thing isn't it if somebody says okay go away and invent a cthulhu cult you might sit there with a piece of paper and go oh, okay oh, i'll come up with some ideas and they might be a bit pedestrian but when you start rolling on tables and you get sort of weirdly contradictory ideas and weird ideas coming out of rolling on the table it does generate something more interesting i mean that sounds like that sounds like a failure of imagination on my part but it's like anything isn't it often when you try and just invent something you end up just defaulting to things you already know whereas when you yeah. roll on a random table it'll throw things at you that you've not really considered because it's it's random well, that's what's great about it, I think. Yeah, and it focuses just on the sources of power and mm. the goals of the cult and yeah. how they set out achieving it. And I've I've been reading this book about spies and how the intelligence agency developed. And there's a lot of parallels between espionage and cults because it, when you're a spy, and it seem, seems to me that cults are the same. It's like an endless recruitment campaign. Mm. As, as spies are constantly trying to find like-minded individuals who they can get to cross over and give them information and they become the handler. And that becomes a kind of raison d'etre. And it feels to me that a cult has a similar approach, doesn't it? That constantly they trying to gather more people into the cause one way or another. Constant recruitment and also the obvious, other obvious parallel is the secrecy of it as well, because obviously you can't be open about a Cthulhu cult, can you? You've got to be secretive. So you're right, it's that thing of how do you recruit someone into a secret society is what makes it interesting, because you can't go around saying, would you like to join my cult that worships a tentacled creature under the sea? You've got to lure them in in a more subtle way, haven't you, before they realise the full horror of what they're doing. Half the book is given over to scenarios that I'm not allowed to read because I think you, you, you picked it up and you, you were inspired to run I'm gonna, something for yeah, us. Yeah, I'm going to run something for you and Eddie. I'm going to run one. There's three at the back, isn't there? There's Lockie's, Lockie's Gift. There's one set in about 1892. And they do form a mini campaign, don't they? So they're all, they are, in, you can run them separately, but they are interconnected. You'd play them with different characters. That's quite a nice idea. You know, you play different characters in different times. So there's Lockie's Gift, which I think is the 1890s, then the Angel's Thirst, which is 1920s, and a God's Dream, which is a modern one. But they're all, they're all interconnected. And the idea is you would play different characters in different 
time time obviously different times but yeah um, i've looked at them and they're quite good so you, you're not allowed to read those read no further as they used to say in those scenario notes if you are playing this read no further read no further prime directive strikes again prime directive which... strikes us <laughs> We would, never, we would never have entertained that, would we, back in the day? We would never have entertained us both owning the same book with the same scenarios in and saying, don't read, don't read them, even though we wouldn't have read them. I would never have read them, but we, no. somehow the Prime Directive, it was forbidden, wasn't it? <laughs> this, this does feel like a referee's book, though, doesn't it? It does feel like if you have that arrangement on your group that you are the keeper, you want to be keeping this away from your players, really, because... Yeah, it, that's an interesting point, that, isn't it? Because it gives certain things away, doesn't it, that you wouldn't want the players to, to know about. That's true, that, yeah. I, I really like the writing of this, and when I uh, when I look back... I, picked off this magazine another Cthulhu special from different worlds I think they did a few of these over the run it's good to compare like we did last time how they were writing about this thing, these things in the 80s compared with this supplement and how this has mm -hmm. developed because I think what we noticed last time was you know, go back to the 70s and 80s what we noticed about the Grolantha writing that Greg Stafford did in publications back in the day, there's not much difference between that and how it's written about now. It's just got more information with it. So going back to uh, different worlds, it feels very different the way that they were writing about cult organisations back then. I think there's an article in here about occult organisations. Yeah, like Cthulhu knows. <laughs> not sure you'd want that, would you? But they're real world org occult organizations, aren't they? So they're the Freemasons and the Esophical Society and the Rosicution Society. Like a lot of these articles from back then, they're more like a Wikipedia entry. So yeah, we they're... now, we don't need this anymore, do we? This mm. kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that's true, that isn't it? Yeah, it is kind of like giving you information that you wouldn't necessarily have access to back then so you wouldn't necessarily know who these organize or what these organizations were unless you decided to go to the local library and get a book on organizations like that which we not wouldn't necessarily do so it's giving you that kind of information and i suppose it's, it's it's a bit more fixated with the real world isn't it Cult's cthulhu is is connected to the real world obviously because it's called cthulhu it's set in the modern or real world but in that article there's a bit more of a fixation with how this fits into the real, real world, as in these are real organisations that you can use, which yeah. it doesn't really do now because, like you say, you can just Google things, can't you? D these organisations, benign organisations, and it made me think, well, maybe some of the cults that you could produce of your own have a relatively benign appearance. Not all of the people involved may know of the motivations or what's going on. Your player characters could actually consult with a cult that has mm. nefarious things going yeah. in the background. But I would say that you know, reading Cults Cthulhu, I think a cult that does appear benign and some of its members are duped is far more interesting as a concept than just a bunch of evil people who were worshipping some weird god and doing something terrible. I think it's a far more interesting proposition, isn't it, that there are people involved in it who think they may be doing good things, but really what they're doing is fueling something very, very bad at its heart that they're not really privy to. Is it? It's yeah. a much more interesting idea, isn't it? And, and using that spy analogy, if play characters come to some of these groups, in exchange for knowledge, the idea is that there is a mutual exchange of knowledge. So the player characters in some way become in cahoots unwittingly mm. with yeah. an occult organization. Well, there have, yeah. And well, I can't, we can't really talk about this, can we? But we, we've, we've played a scenario a few years ago that's very similar to that. Though you realize you're not what all things are not quite what they appear to be. 
which is great. Which is great when that happens. I think. I think again, that's a a great thing for players because I've played more Cthulhu than I've run, so I always have more of a player's perspective on it. I think, even though I've run it, I've played far more. Probably eighty percent of my time has been playing Cthulhu, and about twenty percent of my time been running it. I think as a player, it's always far more exciting and interesting when you are uncertain or fooled a bit by these kind of organizations i quite like that as a player you know it's like a magic trick being pulled on you where you as a player you're not just going oh well mm, they look like a bad lot they're probably the cultists the idea that some organization that seems as you say benign ultimately is revealed to be not very benign at all quite malign as a player that's always kind of great i love those moments where you realize "Uh oh we've made a complete mistake here yeah. <laughs> completely the wrong end of the stick is always a is always a lot of fun and again that's something that in cult cults cthulhu comes across the idea of the recruit people they might have a seem like a legitimate business that kind of thing is good fun in these different worlds as well away from the cults and the occult organizations there's a good article about cthulhu in the 80s and there were a lot of these produced, weren't they? The idea of Cthulhu now. Yeah. And this, and this one seems kind of obsessed with the idea that with increased firepower, these monsters are not going to be any good <laughs> up against an M16 with 10 shots around causing 1D10 plus 6 damage. You see that you, you say that, but that there's a big assumption there that you get a chance to shoot that don't just go insane on the spot. I mean, Thanks. you could you could get a rocket launcher against Cthulhu, couldn't you? But you've got to sort of aim at him and risk losing a D hundred sanity. So suddenly you're pointing your rocket launcher at all the other players, aren't you? Where the article gets a bit more sophisticated is that it starts looking at potential new scientific developments and discoveries that could ultimately expose some vulnerabilities, mythos entities. But well, then it starts to ask the question how scientific developments could get distorted. What if Oppenheimer, the concept was whispered in his ear by Azathoth, this yeah, destructive exactly, power? Exactly, yeah. The destructive weapons are actually being created by the Cthulhu mythos. Not, not to destroy it, but created by it, yeah. And then I, and then I started thinking, well, everybody's talking about it. He can't go anywhere without the AI being mentioned at, at, at work, everybody, mm, well, mm, yeah. enjoy you, enjoy a cup of coffee now, but you know, that cup of coffee can be re replaced by AI in the future. That you know, <laughs> you could have been, AI will be drinking your coffee, yes, <laughs> you won't be, you won't be allowed to drink coffee anymore. AI will drink it for you, will it? Is that, is that right? <laughs> so, so at the risk of sounding like one of those boys. I did think of what have you put chat GTP through the Necronomicon, the Necronomicon through it, that large language model. You could look at all of those Cthulhu mythos um, books, couldn't you? You could put them all through it and it yeah. come back with something meaningful. Or come would back it? With the truth. Yeah. Yeah. It'd drive you insane. Don't do it. Don't do it, Dirk. Don't do it. Would it, would it drive? The artificial intelligence insane. Oh, yeah. Well, What's the SAM role for an artificial intelligence? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. But that Thank isn't you. this, isn't this though? Isn't this the beauty of Cthulhu? What, what you're doing now is why the game has endured for so long, isn't it? Because you're taking something new. Well, AI is not new, but you're taking something topical and just overlaying it with Cthulhu. You're Cthulhuizing it, aren't you? And, and yeah. suddenly you've got an idea and that's why the game is is so popular and has, has lasted and that's why people like us go back to it all the time isn't it because you can just take something put it through the run it through cthulhu and out the other end pops a bit of a scenario oh yeah you know, that's a yeah. what an idea i could could use that and i don't know if there's any is there any other game like that yeah. is there any other role-playing game like that where you can take something anything you like Topical politics, political figures, historical figures, innovations. You, you've done it. I mean, you mentioned Oppenheimer. You mentioned AI. You mentioned anybody, and run it through the Cthulhu mix, and at the other end, 
there's an idea. Uh, is any other game where that, that is the case? I don't think there is. No. And isn't that one of the things that gets levelled at it, this idea that, you know, take any situation, stick a mm. sugar in it, and you've got something. But I think it's it's more than that, isn't it? It comes back, again, that eureka moment of realising, of course, at the yeah. core of the game, is that yeah. these messages are coming from an yeah. extraterrestrial source and it's distorting yeah. how we think about the world. It's dis- distorting reality and how we think about the world and it's got its own mysterious plan. And that mysterious plan can really be whatever you want it to be. And I know I know what you mean, to stick a shog off in it. it. It is like a bit of an standing joke, isn't it? That, oh, Cthulhu this, Cthulhu. Cthulhu on a submarine, Cthulhu in a helicopter, Cthulhu in the North Pole, Cthulhu... I don't know, in Disneyland, anything. I know what you mean. That's true. But I suppose that joke comes from a sort of truth, doesn't it? That that joke only exists because you can do that with the Call of Cthulhu. You can't do it with other games, can you? That's no. why that joke doesn't exist for other games. And if nothing else, I've put this book in front of you and you're going away and promising to run a campaign. Yeah. Whoa, hang on, so- a campaign? I said yeah, and that was what you said. It connected well, you somehow. Can, it was they camping. are connected, so you we could do all three. You could do all three. Yeah, play three different characters and different. You could could do that. Yeah, you heard it here first. It's been recorded, so that stands as I committed to running. <laughs> Even running. if you and Eddie don't want me to, yeah. <laughs> that's what you're getting now. Sorry, Eddie, that's what you're getting. He's made me run a campaign. Cheers, Eddie. Goodbye. My name is Paul Fricker. My name is Mike Mason. And together, Mike and I have written and recorded a new show where you can hear chilling tales of horror. Join us, won't you, at eldritchstories.com. And remember, keep it eldritch. But don't be caught! It's that time in the podcast when we're walking backwards with our caught on we won't feel the benefit on these cold nights but nevertheless we're standing there chatting across the table and uh, it's a bit of closing time chatter and blithe what's been on your mind recently well it's that time of year now isn't it where grog meat is out of the way and i have a few more gaming commitments before before the end of the year but but it doesn't feel as pressurized as this weird pressure with grog meat around three games at grog meat Two at Grog Meet and then one at Morpcon on the Sunday, but all kind of in the same weekend. And suddenly it's like a pressure valve released where I think, all oh, right, right, I'm still running Pirates of Drenex and I've still got things to run, but but nothing like as much. And so my mind kind of turns to next year. Kind of makes, I have this thing now, about now. I start thinking about next year and what I'm going to run. And I can't, I always tell myself this time of year, and I never do it. I always think, I'm going to run that Blake Seven Savage Worlds game. I keep promising myself because I was talking at Grogme about you know to people about it, and Savage Worlds would be perfect for doing Blake Seven. And I, and I, had, I always had the idea of doing a Blake Seven scenario after the final episode, so the guns were on stun. They were on stun, and they're all captured. And the scenario is what happens next. And I, I tell myself this time of year. I'm going to do that next year. I never do. I never do. So maybe I will, but probably won't. <laughs> Beyond Blake 7. Beyond Blake 7. Set to stun. That's the looking title, set to stun. So when they're Beyond. all shot at the end, they, they are on stun, so they're all alive. And you play them. And Savage Worlds is the perfect game for Blake 7 because you've got the hindrances, haven't you? You know, Cowardly Villa, Ruthless Avon, all that kind of thing. I always think of that. And also, I suppose it's the time of year now where I do start thinking about what do I want to run next year? And yeah. half committing myself to what I'm going to run next year. And I'm thinking, I'm going to run some Dying Earth for our Sunday group. Thinking, all right, I'll do that. That's, that's that commit. I've got that commitment already. It's all in the diary, all these commitments. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I'm going through this similar thing. I'm going through a similar thing, but looking at when it'll fit. Because I think we both commented on the fact that we're still working at a um, pandemic lockdown time, aren't we, in terms of gaming? 
putting aside time that we think, oh, we can slip another game in here. And slip in. But honestly, the world is demanding more and more of my time. If it's not Sophie Ellis Baxter, it's my mum. And so <laughs> it so it's fitting it all in, isn't it? It's fitting it all in now that there's a social life beyond gaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. It's, and it's an odd thing, isn't it, with, with lockdown and all the COVID lockdown thing. If it, it feels like it's always been like that, but but it hasn't really. Like you say, pre pre COVID, we didn't do we did quite a lot of gaming. I mean, we do we do more gaming than we've ever done, I suppose. Let's be, let's be honest. But we but you say over lockdown we did more and more and more because there was just more and more time. No one was doing anything. No one was going out. And it feels like that's the norm. But as you say, you got to kind of correct yourself a bit and think, oh, it's not, it's not the norm at all, is it really? So I probably don't have I, time yeah. to write me Blake Seven Savage Worlds game. Have I? There you go. I won't do it. You know. <laughs> Good to clear that up now rather than, you know, halfway through next year. Oh, I hope, <laughs> I hope you do revive it. That'd be great. <laughs> I've been, I've been doing a Substack. Do you know, have you heard of Substack? No. Yeah. I, I've heard of Substack. I don't know what it is. I've seen it on that Discord thing. And I look at it occasionally, and I, I've seen the word Substack, but I don't know what it means, and I, I don't want to get involved in it because it might <laughs> it might just confuse me. As you know, I'm not I'm not the most. I mean, X formerly known as Twitter. In my head, it's not even formerly known as Twitter. It's still Twitter. That's how backward I am when it comes to social media. <laughs> well, sub, Substack is. It's. Do you remember Blogger? Do you remember Blogger? I remember, blog, I know what a blog is. Blogspot blog and all that, yeah. Yeah, it took me blog. a while to get, but I remember that from way back, a blog. Yeah. It's just it's just a blog. It's just a blog, but it sends it out as emails. And it's a, a, a platform. So it's, email, so it's an email. It's an email, yeah. It's, it's an email, email right, in the form of a email. blog. Called it's like a mailing list. But it's also a platform for putting stuff on. Do, do you know, I, I first heard about them through Dominic Cummings as one, and he puts his, like, Mad gibberings on there, and you know, <laughs> going back, they're talking about Cthulhu, <laughs> you see, <laughs> Cthulhu and public figures. There you go, well, up. And, uh, and, uh, pe- people receiving messages and interpreting them. <laughs> but he, he he puts his on a Substack, and I've started using it because we've got we've got the website where you can do like blog entries, and I publish the podcast to it but i've started doing like short pieces that are about gaming but they're sort of adjacent to gaming and Mm. some other local bits of obsessions it's not very good because already two more additional projects have emerged from it that has been time consuming so it's never a good idea but the latest you say say it's so fairly special in your mum but is it or is it your sub stacks there you go (laughs) with some stacks couldn't it what I've written about in the most recent one is about this idea of time pressure. And you know that's a bit of an obsession of mine, of how do you emulate those scenes in the movies and in drama where, you know, the bomb's going to go off and you've got to defuse it. And, and the, it, it's hard to recreate that pressure, isn't it, of like a heist or, you know, there's only so much oxygen in the the, the place. So I've been looking at some of yeah. the mechanical ways of of doing that and uh, I'll probably someday it, it, a few ideas that I've developed on that but it did get me thinking of those little knotty problems that you get as when you're playing role playing games that you sort of want to spend time working out have you what, what's your what's your obsession by the I, I think that, that one that you've mentioned is is a is a good one, isn't it? Like say time pressure, because whenever you play a game, you've, you've got to give players the opportunity to talk about their plans, but equally you want to give them a sense of pressure that you, you're not got forever to talk about this. That, that six second combat round. Yes, of course you can talk about what you're going to do because you're not going to give you six seconds to decide, but equally, I don't want you spending 20 minutes because you know, it's it's all happening very quick. So I want to put you under some pressure. It's that thing of uh, the parallel of game time and real time. So the idea of like, well, you could restrict real time. Well, that's not right, is it? Because real time 
telescopes and goes in and out depending on the situation that they're in. So game game time seems to be the place yeah. to do it. But if you do it as obsessional resource management of right, you've used three seconds or four seconds, somewhere you've got to abstract it, haven't you? And that's what um, this Substack talks about, really, just like using various methods of how do you represent that in a game so that it feels exciting but not too onerous. I think was another I, touching on when you mentioned about resource management. I always think resource management is always a thorny subject in games as well, isn't it? Because I always think it's important, and yet I always hand wave it. I always hand wave it. I always get bored by the idea of ammunition, number of bullets in your gun, and all that kind of arrows. Even though in the back of my mind, I think those things are important because ultimately, that's the difference, isn't it? That's the difference between a, a missile weapon and a sword. The missile weapon, you're going to run out of arrows eventually. So the guy's pinning you down with a ball. You make him shoot enough, he's run out of arrows. But I do that in a game. I never do it. And I always think I should. But it, but it sort of bores me a bit. Yeah. The, <laughs> games again, that do, like, the games that do that, you kind of push against it, don't you? You're thinking, oh, do I have to do this? Do I have to do it? Yeah. Yeah. You do get games that deal with it and you think, oh, for God's sake, do I have to do that? You know. I was doing some, uh, it's like <laughs> I was doing some, in, in Pirates of Dune, actually, you've recruited some more pirates for your ship, haven't you? You've given them all weapons. And I was putting together the NPCs the other day for our game on Saturday. And you've given them all ghost rifles and they have 80 rounds. Of ghost, and I thought, great, 80 rounds? You're never going to have to worry about running out of bullets and a fire, are you, with 80 rounds? And I, <laughs> I thought, never, then I go again. You know, I'm bothered about resource management. But equally, I'm not because it bores me. I wish there was, it's, it's only that middle ground, isn't it, of it, where you think there is some resource management, but it's not onerous or overshadowing no. the game or anything like that. Nice one. Well, thanks, Blythe, and well done because we've got through two episodes talking about cults without having a fraudulent slip and having to put an explicit label on the podcast. Yeah, we've so. done well there, haven't we? Excellent. With the famous. <laughs> Mike Hunt incident rings, doesn't it? But anyway, <laughs> till next time. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks to Mike Mason for being a great guest at Grog Meet. In the evening in the pub, he was challenging us with a you can only keep one Conan the Barbarian, Excalibur, Sword and the Sorcerer. Which would it be? Which would yours be? Make sure that you follow Mason and Fricker's Eldritch Stories. There's a link in the show notes. Talking of stories, we'll be looking at fiction next year in the Grog Pod Book Club. Members want to revisit the Appendix N authors and some of the Appendix G. It's on the first Sunday of the month, except when it isn't. See the grognardfiles.com for details. I mentioned the substack that I've done, and there's about six different articles on there. One of them turned into a project known as the Grogvine, which means that five books are currently making their way around the world. Pages are being created by wonderful people, and I'm looking forward to them coming back to me in the next few months so I can share what's been made. Grog Meat, this podcast and all the projects that we support are only possible due to the kind and generous support of the Patreons. Thank you to everyone past and present who have supported us. It covers the costs, allows us to invest in the content and encourages us to carry on. It's been a while since I last did a shout out to new Patreons, so welcome to Brian Duggard, Robert Baker, Tom Wright, Neho and Rob Arcangeli. For people who pledge at the so far so good level, I like to give a virtual gift from the topic under discussion. And this time I've gone to the Colts book. I'm going to be rolling on some dice to give some presents. So here we go. First up is going to be Max and Andrew McDonald, who were on my Quorum Stormbringer game. 
and enjoyed being mabdom saboteurs a little too much, I think. Anyway, let's roll on this. Oh, uh, they get protection from one of the idols of Relier. Thanks to you both. David Cody, he gets a Cthulhu shroom. Dan Morris gets a processor from the Church of Perfect Science. Fred Folds gets the Black Drop. Dave Churchill, he gets a pain inducer. William Plumridge, oh, due to his level of support, he gets a spell. Oil of Silence. Finally, Martin Rungvist, he gets a chance to summon a black-winged one. There we go. Thank you to you all, and thanks for listening. I look forward to speaking to you next time. Until then, adios, amigos.